won't go into the differences. I uh, won't just leave it at that. Uh, so no, glad everyone's here this morning. Uh, just a couple of things, by the way, of announcements. We did start our Wednesday night small groups, and if you have not had a chance to sign up and are not a part of those, we do still have the sign-ups in the foyer. So please take a look at the groups that are uh, that are running. Uh, should be the addresses there. If not, let me or the pastor know, and we can get you the addresses for those. Uh, or if you have any questions, please do that as well. After this service, there will be a senior adult fellowship. Uh, for those, that's not uh, seniors as in seniors in high school. It's uh, the slightly older than that crowd. So, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> leave it there and then um, and as I am not Adam we do have uh, we do have uh, a guest speaker today and we're very happy to have uh, Phil Lytle and he'll do a little bit more of an introduction to himself of course uh, many of you know Phil when he was attending here and of course his uh, parents are still here but uh, Phil nice to have you look forward to hearing from you a little bit later but now we'll return to worship thank you let's all stand as we sing how great is our God
were said, that in God's hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Let's pray. Father, you are the source of our lives and you own the breath that we breathe. So often we fall short of recognizing that all that we have is yours. We fall short of using our breath for bringing you glory. And so this morning, we pray, Father, that you would make us right with you, that uh, anything that we have put between ourselves and you, that you would remove, whether it's something that's distracting us in this moment or a sin that we need to yield to you and run away from. And God, we ask you to accept the offering of our breath this morning as it returns to you in praise, that this would be a time when you are pleased with our worship, a time when you work in our lives to transform us, not to leave us the same way that we came, but to leave us closer to you through the power of your Holy Spirit, thanks to the work of Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.
come to this part of the service, we've uh, worshiped through song, we've worshiped through prayer, now we get to worship through our giving. And even though we are not passing the plate, uh, you are still able to give. We have a box in the foyer. Uh, you can give online as well or drop a check by the office, uh, however, however it suits you. Uh, but please do not uh, give up the opportunity uh, to give to the Lord in, uh, in, in worship. So let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. Lord, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you, Lord, for being a gracious and benevolent Heavenly Father. Lord, the fact that we woke up this morning, Lord, the fact that, uh, Lord, we had beds to sleep in and homes, Lord, cars to get us here, uh, Lord, family, Lord, Christian brothers and sisters, and Lord, a church to uh, worship. Lord, we thank you for it all. Everything that we have comes from you. And we thank you that we have this opportunity to give back to you, uh, Lord, uh, in, in recognition. And Lord, pray that you would take these tithes, that you would take these offerings. Lord, pray that uh, your will would be done with each and every one of them. And it's in your son's precious name that we do pray. Amen. Please be seated. This is a song that we introduced last week. Please join us as we sing Grace. <clears throat> Oh 
Good morning. It's good to be able to look out and see you all. Um, you know, when you look at the scriptures, you'll find that most of them are written by Jewish people. Maybe, the, maybe Luke was not Jewish. Maybe he was a proselyte. And it was written primarily to Jewish people. We have a few books of the New Testament that are written to Gentile audiences. The entirety of the Old Testament scriptures are written to Jewish people. The fact that this book that we study, the revelation that God has given us is to and from the Jewish people makes their culture and makes addressing the Jewish people rather unique. Now God created the Jewish people with a special purpose in mind. If you go back, he called them out of Egypt, he brought them to Mount Sinai, and right before he gives them the Ten Commandments, he explains his purposes for the people of Israel, what he's about to do. He he says that they're supposed to be a special people, a people for his own possession, that they're supposed to enjoy a special relationship with him, that they are called to be a kingdom of priests to God in Exodus 19.6, as well as they're created to live holy lives, that they are to be a holy nation. So God's program for Israel was a program to call out a people to be separate to him, to be a witness to the nations. And as a result of that, the scriptures make specific statements regarding Israel and God's plan for the Jewish people. Uh, They are unique, we can say, in many ways. Now today we're going to look a little bit at the book of Romans. If you've got your Bible, you may want to open to chapter 9. The book of Romans is Paul's clearest exposition of his theology. It's, It's Paul had not had a chance to go to Rome, and he wanted to give them a gift, and the gift he wanted to give them was his preaching of the gospel. And so when he opens the book, he starts by saying that I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and he begins to lay out what is the gospel that he preaches, and he starts by telling us that people are sinful. He starts with the the, uh, pagan... He shows that the pagan sinful, and he talks about the moral people being sinful, and he goes on to the religious people being sinful, and he, he summarizes that by saying all are sinful. And then he goes on to explain that the gospel is, is the message of what God is doing to alleviate that situation. How by faith in what God is doing, people are being saved how the Messiah came and died, and putting faith in Him and faith alone is what brings us into a relationship with Him. But of course, the Gospel is also about how God is changing us. And so he talks about being freed from sin, no longer under sin. And he talks about how we are to live our lives to God. And of course, he acknowledges very clearly that there are some issues. He talks about the frustration that he feels as he discovers that what he wants to do, he doesn't do. And he moves from that into the work of the Spirit and talks how, how the Spirit has come into our lives, that we are children of God, that the Spirit bears, bears witness that we're those children, and that He's there to sanctify us and to change us. And as he comes to the close of chapter 8, Paul reaches a, a kind of a height where he's praising the Lord, speaking about His love and how we can never be separated from that love. Now, if you know Paul, you know that he likes to explain theology And when he gets to the high point in his theology, he then moves into the practical aspect of things. And of course, the practical aspect of things in in the book of Romans, we find in chapter 12 in verse 1. He says, I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. That's the application that he has of all these teachings. But you'll notice there's a bit of a gap between the end of chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 12. 
Because Paul has another very important theological issue that he has to address before he comes to his application. And if we open to chapter 9, let's read uh, the first few verses. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Messiah, the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. We see Paul's heart. He has a heart for his people. And we see that they are the ones to whom all this riches that he talks about in chapters 1 through 8 belong. And yet they aren't experiencing that. And this raises a profound issue. And he brings this issue up in verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. You see, the issue is, Can God be counted on? When God gave all those promises and made all those plans, did He know what He was doing? And so Paul goes and and needs to explain that indeed God knows what He's doing. It's not that God's words failed. It's not an issue that somehow or another He was surprised. (laughs) You know, I think sometimes we think, What happens in this world surprises God. But Paul is being very clear. No, it was clear according to the scriptures that the Jewish people were going to stumble. They were going to stumble over this message of faith and over grace. Paul talks about that in verse 32. He talks about how they pursued salvation as if it were based on works. And he says they've stumbled over the stumbling stone. And he quotes Isaiah, and he quotes several different places in Isaiah where this idea of the Messiah being a stone is used, and he, and he, he, he makes it clear that, no, God knew what he was going to do. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going on. Now, this stumbling, if you will, or this, this lack of faith has, has raised a lot of questions in some people's minds. There are those people who would say, Okay, God is now done with the Jewish people. His plan was to bring them along, and when the time came when they stumbled and fell, that, they would, that the church would step in and take the place of Israel. Um, that they would replace Israel in God's plan somehow. And Paul has quite a bit to say about that as well. He would say that, he goes on to explain a little bit about, more about faith, and in chapter 11, he, he comes back to this issue. Of what about the Jewish people? What about God's plan? And he, he starts in chapter 11, verse 1, and he says this. He says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? And that would be the first question. Did, did, did God say, you are rejected? And the answer is, no way. By no means, it's very strong, it's a very strong statement. No way, that is not who God is. And and Paul starts by giving himself as an example. I am an Israelite, and God has saved me. That there are those of us among the people of God who, who, who are kept, a remnant who are a part of God's people. But he also goes on, to talk more broadly. And he, we go down to verse 11, we read, So I ask, did they stumble that they might fall? Looking at the people as a whole. And again he says, by no means. But rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. God has used, he says in the next verse, their trespass to bring the riches of the gospel to us. Now, I'm going to assume here, because I'm in Harrisonville, that probably there's not anybody here who's Jewish. Somebody might be from a Jewish background here, but we're sitting here, 
we have all the promises that God has made and they're part of our life. Because in God's plan, part of it was that this, would, this message would come to us as the Gentiles. And that has come to us for the purpose of making them jealous. We'll talk a little bit more about this idea of jealousy. But God has not caused them to stumble and to fall. He still has a plan, a plan for the people of Israel. And the fact that they have not accepted the Messiah does not mean that he has given up on them. Now, you all know that I minister in Israel. So let me talk a little bit now about what is the spiritual state of Israel. Israel for many, many years was dispersed, right? There was an end to national life and they've been dispersed around the world. And then in, in the, starting in the early 1800s and uh, the late 1800s and the early 1900s, they began to come back. In 1948, we had a state of Israel established today. And of course, evangelicals, we're all <laughs> interested in that. That's something that we've taken note of. And, and the question is, is, though, are, these, is, are these events part of the fulfillment of God's promises? And I think most of us would look at it and say, yes, it's so. But when you look at Israel today, it's not fulfilling its calling to be a people of God by any stretch. In fact, if you look at Israel, only about 15% of the people in the country are what we would call religious. And of course, that religion isn't faith in the Messiah, it's, you can probably see these people, you know, they're dressed, they're all kind of black and white and hats and that kind of thing, and it's, it's, it's a traditional legalistic religion where the real point is to keep what they call the mitzvot, the commandments, and, um, and uh, if you will, it's a kind of a honor God, but he doesn't really have an interest in me personally, it's kind of as a nation. And that's only 15%. The other, there's probably another 70% who are atheistic, agnostic, don't even believe in God at all. Um, and you look at that and you say, well, you know, what about God and his promises? Well, certainly, God is maybe keeping his promises, but he's left, the people right now are in this state of what I would call superstitious secularism. They have been hurt by this religious system that leaves them devoid of any relationship with God. They've been separated from the message of the, of the gospel, of a God who's interested in them. In fact, I, I can remember early on in our, our, our time, there was a, a man who we got to know who was religious in his background, American background. And I remember sitting down, we were talking to him once, and I, I asked him, you know, does God care for you? Does God love you? And he says, God, God has no interest in me personally. All he's interested in is in the nation, and that the nation as a whole keeps the covenant with, with Abraham. And so this, this has left them very empty. Now, in that emptiness, there's a seeking for God. And where they're doing most of this seeking is not in the Bible. In fact, in order to graduate from high school in Israel, you've got to take a test on the Bible. You start in second grade, you study the Old Testament. Now, not the, whole, not the Bible as we know it, the Old Testament. And most of them don't really understand it, never mind really believe in it. And so... When they get older, they're looking elsewhere, outside of, of Israel, primarily, I would say, to the east. I, I think a good example is a, a friend of mine named Erez. I, I met Erez very early on in our time in Israel, and I think he's a very typical example of what you can expect of people from Israel. He grew up in a secular home, did not believe in God, after high school, he went to the army, the IDF. Most, almost everyone has to serve two and a half to three years in the army. After the army, most people want to kind of clear their heads. Um, 
Some of you who know the family, my kids have been back here after their army service. Uh, spent, uh, my youngest son spent some time working on a pig farm, something good Jewish boys don't normally do in Israel, right? Uh, <laughs> in any case, it's to clear their head. It's to get away from some of that responsibility, and part of it is also to seek. They want to seek something. And where do they seek? Well, they go to Nepal, they'll go to India. And my friend Ares went to India. And he says when he was in India, he finally ran into spiritual reality in one of the ashrams of Hinduism. While he was there, he said, I I met spiritual evil. And he came to believe that Satan exists and the corollary being that maybe God exists too. Now, he didn't give it a lot more thought, but in his travels, and of course Israelis try to get when they're young like that to wherever they can, as cheap as they can, he ended up in Amsterdam in a Christian hostel that would let him get his room for a little bit of sweeping things out. And when he was there, he met someone who said they'd become a Christian. Now, that makes sense to us, what it means to become a Christian, but to the Israeli mindset, that, that, that's nonsensical. You're, you're born Muslim, you're born Jewish, and you're born Christian. What do you mean you became a Christian? And here, for the first time, he heard the testimony of someone who got to share about how they came into a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, how that could happen. And he was very curious about it. The, the place was able to find a New Testament in Hebrew, and he gladly accepted it. Of course, it went into his backpack, and it stayed there for about two weeks. Why? Well, it's a superstitious culture. And the rabbis have taught people that if you read the New Testament, you're liable to get cursed. And so it sat there. And he finally came to the point of saying, look, this makes no sense. Why would I think that this book would curse me? I I don't believe anything else. And so he began to open up the New Testament and started to read it for the first time in his life. And he said he discovered three things as he read the New Testament. The first thing he discovered was that Jesus, or Yeshua, was Jewish. Now, if you've read the New Testament, (laughs) page one is the genealogy of of Jesus. And and it's clear that he is Jewish. But to the average Jewish person, Jesus is a Gentile Messiah. And so he was surprised as he read that. Now, the second thing he was surprised at as he read, and you don't have to get very far, get into the Sermon on the Mount, and you find that his teaching is very Jewish. In fact, most Jewish people don't know that there are many sayings of the rabbis in the Talmud that actually were originally from Yeshua that the rabbis took over later. Yeshua's teaching was Jewish, and it was familiar. It's like, this is part of my culture, my heritage. But the third thing that really surprised him was that he liked Yeshua. He liked this guy. Now, I think for us that just seems weird. Why wouldn't you like Jesus? But you see, for the Jewish people, for almost 2,000 years, they've been persecuted and killed in the name of Jesus. The church has gone and during the Crusades, for instance, locked them up in synagogues and burned the synagogues down with them inside, chanting things about the cross. And so for many Jewish people, the thinking is, Yeshua must have been the worst anti-Semite in the history of the world because look at all the anti-Semitism that's directed against us. And as he read and, and discovered the character and the nature of Yeshua, he came to the conclusion, this is our Messiah, and we've just missed it. And of course, like many Jewish people who come to faith, he thought he's the only one who knows this, and I've got to get back and tell everybody. Well, thankfully, he wasn't the only one. <laughs> and thankfully, he is in the business of telling people today about Yeshua. Erez came back, and we had the opportunity to be in fellowship for a few years as... Um, 
helped him to grow in his faith, and he eventually received his PhD and is now the president of the Israel College of the Bible that he leads and directs, which not only trains men to be servants in the body, but also has a very large evangelistic out, uh, outreach through what's called One for Israel. So that's the story of eras, and that, I think, gives us an example of where is Israel today? Now, the next thing I, I guess we could look at is, well, what's, what's our part? First of all, what's my part? What's your part in this whole story? Well, as far as my part in the story, I, I, I grew up here. I didn't know much about Jewish people, but I guess because it might have been because of the interest in the mid-60s and on that I, I heard about Israel and they talked about prophecy when I was in youth group. But I, I had an interest in Israel, but I never met anybody who was Jewish until I got to school. I, 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 I went to a school in Massachusetts, MIT, if you've heard of it. When I was a kid, no one had heard of it. I went to go to MIT and no one knew what MIT was. What are you going to there for? But in any case, uh, it, it was, it's, a, it's an engineering school and I went there and I met some Jewish people. And I got involved in an outreach with Jews for Jesus. And I thought that this would be a direction the Lord would have me go. But through some stir- circumstances, it became kind of told to me that if you're not Jewish and you can't make Aliyah, which is to go live in Israel, we don't need you there. And I thought, well, being an engineering kind of guy, if you, God doesn't send you anywhere you're not needed, so... We'll go look other places. But the Lord did a great work in my heart. First of all, I I learned to really share my faith effectively, which I'm thankful for. And the second thing is I learned about how to live the life. The whole message of Romans chapter 8 about the Spirit and His power in in our life to make us like Him became a reality. And I, I was introduced to a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. It's a book written by a man named Robert Coleman who who explains what was Yeshua's plan. He he gave us the Great Commission. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. But it, it was a plan that he had that was more than just the command, where he had taken 12 men and he trained them and prepared them that they would train others. Paul, in the second letter to Timothy, in Timothy 2.2, explains this when Paul, speaking to Timothy, says, the things that you, Timothy, have learned from me, Paul, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This concept of multiplication. And the Lord really made it clear, Phil, this is what I have called you to do. Well, I came back here. I worked here for a couple of years, I had a few debts to pay off from MIT. It was a little expensive. I worked at Bendix, what was Bendix, and I don't know, it's Honeywell now or something up in the city. And my wife, who happens to be from New Jersey, we met at MIT, got married. She came back and lived here for a while, so some of you guys know her pretty well. And then in uh, 1989, or 1985, we joined staff with Campus Crusade, went to Dartmouth, and in 1989, uh, the Lord made clear that there was a need in Israel. I began to understand how little they knew about the gospel and that the role that we could play in the lives of people there. And what is that role? Well, that role is to help make them jealous. Now, what is jealousy? Well, jealousy is when you're trying to get something or you have something that I think should belong to me. Okay? Okay. if, if, if Heidi were here and one of you guys started to hit on my wife, I would be jealous. And I should be jealous because she's my wife. And if you're trying to get her attention, that's just not the right thing to do, right? And so I know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I, I, I have a personal relationship with him. I talk to him every day. And for the average Jewish person, that should stir up, well, what do you mean? You're not Jewish. You, you're, you, that's my God. Of course, I don't know him, but... Okay, so that is the basis of what our relationship is supposed to be. Um, I think that we, we find that as, as 
Gentiles, we get to spend quality time with people and they get to see our lives and that is how they, they come to understand that there is a reality in our life that goes beyond the reality that they experience. Now, during our time in Israel, we've been there in various ways. Uh, the first, at first, I, I tell people I figured out how to cram a two-year degree into five years because that's the way I got a visa to be able to stay. They don't always just welcome you to come to Israel as a missionary. And I spent many years studying until finally the, the, uh, there was an opportunity to get a visa through the Baptist Convention in Israel. There are a few of those available. And uh, that opened the door for a lot of things that we were able to do in terms of sharing our faith. But the, the, the thing that really made the biggest opening was the result of, of a tragedy in our lives. We're, we're celebrating, or not really, you don't celebrate, you remember, you mourn the loss of so many people on 9-11. And... Uh, we unfortunately had the experience of losing our oldest daughter, our second child, in a terrorist attack in Israel. And we joined the, the group of terror victims in the world as a result. But having suffered with the Jewish people, they recognized us as someone that they would adopt. And so we became citizens of Israel as a result and are dual citizens of both the United States and of Israel. And during that time, and in these, in, these oppor- in these ways, there are opportunities for people to observe our lives. Uh, one of those opportunities has been a, a young woman named Elisheva. I'll start by talking about Elisheva. There are some of you here who get our letters and who have been praying for Elisheva. Elisheva was a good friend of our oldest son, and when she was in junior high and high school, had some contact with us. She's from England. She's an English background Jewish person. And um, she always had a curiosity about spiritual things. Elisheva also has suffered quite a bit of, uh, I think, well, some of it's uh, mental and emotional illnesses. But it also comes down to the fact that that she wants some peace and she wants to know God. And so, starting in about January, she, she renewed contact. Why? Well, part of the reason why is the way our response to the tragedy that we've experienced has been reflected through our relationship with God is something that, that caught her attention. And she, she came and started asking questions. At one point, she prayed the sinner's prayer. And I I, I think that she really does believe that she struggles. She struggles not only with her her emotional issues, but she struggles with her identity because she's Jewish. And for her, it's hard to reconcile all the things she's been taught about who I am as someone who's Jewish with being a believer in the Messiah and recognizing that this is is a Jewish thing to do and that that it's something that reflects who I really am. You know, I could think of lots of other people like a good friend, Ido. Ido is a professor of philosophy at the University of Haifa, who we got to know over the years. Um, Ido knew us before Abigail was killed and, of course, after, after she died. And Ido, as a philo- many philosophers, you know, are pretty uh, atheistic, <laughs> agnostic. It's been interesting to see. Ido has not come to faith. But Ido has asked a million questions and has definitely moved from being a very solid atheist to being a very wishy-washy agnostic. Why? Because he's seen that there is something there, that there's something in his life, in our life, that he's missing in his life. I think the, the, the most interesting story, because maybe it's the most successful story, not the, is, is that of Shai. Shai is another one of Josiah's friends. And we always had Shai around. Shai would come to our Kabbalat Shabbat. On, in, in the Jewish culture, Shabbat is on Saturday, 
and in the evening before on Friday night, you have a meal. If you've seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof, you've seen that. Because in Fiddler on the Roof, they hurry, hurry, and they light the candles, and then they sing this song, and they, they all have a meal together. It's very traditional in Jewish society to have a family meal. And so people will come together on Friday nights. And our house usually has a lot of people in it. And Shai was, was one of those who came and came. And along with the believing people who were there, he heard the gospel. In fact, it got to the point that several years ago, I, I, I know someone came and asked him, well, do you know what the Lytles believe? And he said, yeah, shared the whole gospel with them. And well, do you believe that? No, no, don't believe in God. But in the Lord's time and in the Lord's way, something changed because that's what the Lord does, right? He's the one who saves us. And he began to start questioning, well, maybe there is a God, and maybe I should start looking into this. And, and Shai came to faith. We had the privilege of helping him because really a big part of what our ministry is is raising up disciples. Uh, Shai was in a small group and began to grow, uh, going through a good in-depth study of Romans and some other things, um, met a young woman who was a believer, got married. And today, Shai serves uh, in, the, in an administrative capacity in our congregation and is a leader among the young people in our congregation. That's really, I think, the bottom line with what has the Lord called us to do, to be, to be those who present a relationship with Israel's God to the people of Israel to stir them up to jealousy, and then as they come into an interest to help them to see the truth of who he is and when they come to that moment of truth to build them in their faith. So Paul talks a lot about this issue of jealousy um, here in, in chapter 11. He talks about our relationship, first of all, as the Gentiles, he, ta- he uses the, the picture of an olive tree. He says, look, there's this tree and natural branches are broken off and you've been grafted in to explain the relationship that we have as, as a people. And um, he, he talks about how there is a time that will be coming where all Israel will be saved. Um, and that... And he makes it clear that if we turn to chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, that in regards to the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. Now, there's a lot of ways you can respond to to, to jealousy. The godly way to respond, if someone were hitting on Heidi, would be for me to recognize that this emotion that comes up called jealousy is urging me to get to her and attract her to me more, to spend time with her, to, to deepen that relationship. Okay, That's what jealousy should do. What it often does, though, is that the guy who's trying to hit on her becomes the object of my hatred and I'll hit him. <laughs> okay, you, You've seen the, the jealous guy who's going to punch this guy out, right? Well, unfortunately, that's the reaction that can be expected with jealousy. And so Paul says, as regards the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. But, and there's a but right there, as regards election, they're beloved for the sake of their forefathers. God makes promises. He said to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he said, that he was going to multiply their seed. He said, I'm going to be the God of your descendants. To Israel at Mount Sinai, he made promises. And that's what this election is. Election is God's choice. God has chosen this people. And he goes on to make it clear that he says in verse 29, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't take back his promises. God is not the kind of God who who is surprised, 
who is offended by what we do to the point of changing his mind about who we are. God is faithful to what he said he's going to do. And so Paul, before he could talk to us about how to apply the gospel, had to make clear that God was faithful and powerful to do all that he had promised so that we could count on what he said. And that is demonstrated in Israel. It's demonstrated in what he has promised he will do and and the knowledge that he will do that. In in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, Zechariah tells us that they will look upon him whom they've pierced and will mourn. God has a plan for the people of Israel. He has made promises to the people of Israel. They don't live in that promise. I mean, we could look around and say that there are plenty of Christians that have been made promises that aren't living in those promises either here in in America. We could probably say that's true. But certainly for Israel, there is no doubt that that is the case. There's a, a need in Israel for a spiritual awakening the need to see the reality of what God has done. Uh, Right now, you could talk about this society. This society is woke, I think. Isn't that what they call it? They see all the, the, the social needs that we have and all the problems that we have, but they haven't been awoken because they the human solutions fail. There is no human solution to the problems that we're trying to face. Not really. Because the root of the problem is spiritual. It's not social. And so Israel needs an awakening. And our our purpose in Israel is simply to lay a foundation. Lay a foundation for that time when God chooses to awaken hearts. Whether it's like Shai, where he knew the gospel forward and backward, but couldn't respond until God awoke his heart. So we are there to be a part of bringing a foundation so that people will be awoken. And as we look at this, I think about what the application of this is to us here, to you today. First of all, you need to know that what God has said to you, to us, is something that he will do. He is good for his promises. If he has called you, he's not going to give up on you. If he has gifted you, he will not take it back. That is not who he is. He is faithful and he can be trusted. As a church, God's promises to us collectively are true. We can count on those things. We can trust Him to do what He has said. And we can trust Him for all that He says He's going to do in our world and in our society, that He will come. He will rescue us from this evil world. And He will bring in a new world and a new earth. And in the meantime, our job is to walk by faith. As Paul then goes on in chapter 12 to say, that we should present ourselves to him as a living sacrifice. So, let's close in prayer as we think about the God who is faithful and recognize his promises are good and true. Father, I do want to thank you. I want to thank you that we know that you have made promises that will be kept. We praise you for being the kind of, of person who does not, change, who is not surprised. Father, you, you know what's going to happen. You know what we're going to do tomorrow. You know exactly who we are, and you love us. Father, we praise you that you have given us the payment for our sins, that we can stand secure in the fact that you will never forsake us. We 
praise you that we can stand assured that what is going on in the world around us has not taken you by surprise. We stand assured knowing that you will do the things that you've promised, both in our lives and in this world. And we ask that we would give, be given the opportunity to deepen our walk with you and to trust you. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing our closing song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. this week.